Now, I'd like to focus on a few of the more efficacious applications of biofeedback, including urinary incontinence in females. We have an expert here in the audience. Anxiety, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, autism, hypertension, and rehabilitation. Approximately 13 million Americans, mostly women, are affected by urinary incontinence. It occurs often post-childbirth when the pelvic floor muscles are weakened so they can't keep the bladder neck closed properly. Incontinence also leads to depression, especially in women between the ages of 18 to 44, where the prevalence of approximately 30% compared to only 9.2% in women without urinary incontinence. There are three common types, urge incontinence, which is basically the uncontrollable uh, urge to urinate, stress incontinence, which occurs when laughing, coughing, standing quickly, and mixed incontinence, which is a combination of both of those. Well, basically, it's a use it or lose it scenario. As in any muscle building exercise, you must put the muscle under stress for it to grow stronger and larger. Most of you, especially women, have heard of the Kegel exercises to strengthen pelvic floor muscles for pre- and post-childbirth. EMG biofeedback is basically power-charged Kegels. It helps identify the specific muscles which keep the neck of the bladder closed. If you think about it like a balloon, you're trying to keep the, the, muscle, the neck closed so that when you laugh, cough, or whatever, it doesn't leak. And it reinforces you with the feedback. As the resting muscle increases in size, the bladder becomes much less prone to leakage. The initial sessions with the therapist might include placing sensors both on the abdomen and the pelvic floor regions. And the idea is to, to tense just the pelvic floor region and not the abdominal muscles, otherwise, again, you're squeezing the bladder. Then the focus is really only on the pelvic floor area. Several studies have shown that it takes an average 11 treatment sessions to produce a success rate of between 55 to 90 percent decrease in incontinence symptoms. It's also very helpful for males if they train both in advance and following prostate surgery. They can more quickly regain control of bladder function. I'll just show you briefly what this is. This is, this is a typical training screen. And this is, down here is the abdominal muscle. So the person's been told to keep those muscles still. And you see almost no activity at all. It's very, very low. And here is the pelvic floor muscle. So five seconds quiet, five seconds tense. When you get in the green area, it means you're above the threshold. Then relax for five seconds, tense and hold, relax and tense and hold. So it's just a series of, of uh, just as if you were doing curls or, or push-ups, it's a series of exercises for the muscles. And home training can be really effective. Um, and the 92-year-old mother of uh, one of my friends became continent within two weeks of using our little home trainer. And she did it all by herself. She was living in, I believe it was Wisconsin. This is the device that she used. It's called the U-Control. And these are the sensors. And this is a, um, a two-channel system for the computer, for two EMGs for the abdom abdomen and for the pelvic floor. And this is called our Myotrack Infinity or U-Control Infinity, which monitors like a Palm Pilot. You can do all the exercises on the device, then plug it into a computer or do it with the computer. So we have several devices to cover this market. There are five main categories of anxiety disorders, which include phobias, panic disorders, generalized anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress syndrome, acute stress syndrome, and obsessive compulsive disorder. And she's scary, eh? <laughs> Anxiety disorders are most commonly diagnosed in 25 to 44-year-olds in individuals who are separated or divorced and those with low socioeconomic status. The chance of having an anxiety disorder sometimes during your life is approximately one in eight, and is twice as common in women as in men. Maybe that's because of the men. I'm, you know, I'm not so sure. <laughs> Stress is ubiquitous. Uh, the father of stress, Dr. Hans Selye, wrote, every stress leaves an indelible scar, and the organism pays for its survival after a stressful situation by becoming a little older. This is a, a doctored photo distributed on the Internet is real, but it certainly highlights a potentially stressful situation. Good photoshopping. There are many techniques to teach relaxation. Many of you will recognize 
this unsuccessful t attempt at using use of a relaxation phrase. A Seinfeld moment. <laughs> However, biofeedback has proven to be very effective in treating anxiety disorders for you cat lovers. Let me describe how I used it for an elevator phobic using a process called systematic desensitization coupled with biofeedback. Um, this is when I was at the Allen as a patient. Well, maybe. Um, this woman came in. She, had a, she was really afraid of ele elevators. So the first thing we did was just we just sat her down and we monitored her stress level with this. And then we described getting on an elevator. And if it went up, she would back off and decide, describe just thinking about approaching the elevator. And then when she could keep the tone low and then she, we could have her visualize getting on the elevator, going up and down, then we actually did it. We, we walked towards the elevator, listening to the tone. And it took several weeks. And then you know, we held the elevator on, on hold. And eventually, we were able to ride up and down the elevator. And, and the real trick with this is um, with, all, with desensitization is actually teaching people to self-calibrate, to recognize the stress levels so that they know that on a 0 to 10 scale, if they get above a 5, it's going to be really difficult to control themselves. So they say, oh, I'm at a 3. I think I'll use the relaxation skills that I learned. Now I'm going to bring myself down. And every time they get up to a 3, 4, 5, they bring themselves back down again. So that's the process that we use. As we all know, alcohol and drug abuse are a huge problem in society today. It's estimated that approximately 4% of Canadian adults are alcoholics. And the annual cost to Canada's economy related to alcohol and other drug addictions is approximately $40 billion. Big number. <laughs> I did uh, look, look through the internet for some interesting pictures, to say the least. Neurofeedback and biofeedback have been used for years to help addicts deal with both abnormal brainwave activity and stress related to their addictive behavior. The most popular techniques to treat alcoholism combine psychotherapy with hand temperature biofeedback and enhancements of low brainwave frequencies, since low levels of these relaxed and sleepy states are commonly found in this population. It's interesting to note that training people to get into this relaxed state often produces emotionally charged and uncomfortable feelings, normally masked by the addiction. And one might say maybe that's the reason that they become addicts is because they're very uncomfortable with their own emotions. Positive results of neurofeedback include decrease in stress and depression and prolonged abstinence. Similar results have also been found with other forms of substance abuse. 